since I was your first president 40 years ago, and I'm still president. <laughs> If they keep telling Susie I'm not going to retire until I die, so you got me. This will be Clark's 20th annual presentation for our farm and ranch workers. In my impression, he's always called it for land's sake. But this time he's going to change the title. Nothing but blue sky in the big sky? No, oh, you went back. Oh. You must have got some new data. <laughs> We're fortunate to have three screens, so hopefully you're sitting where you can see the, all the numbers. You'll notice Charlie Russell is up there. Charlie Russell is my favorite artist. I can remember back in about 1961, I was a sophomore at Montana State College in Agriculture, and I happened to wrangle a date with Miss Minnesota. So I thought I'd really impress her. I took her down to Ralph Ferraro's Overland Express and ordered two fillets and a glass of wine. We sat down, and before they even brought the salad, he said, who's your favorite artist? I said, well, Charlie Russell. Who else? He said, oh, Charlie Russell didn't paint the true colors of Montana. I said, oh. I got up, said, date's over. Put her back to the dorm. <laughs> so, if you like Charlie, you can stay for lunch. <laughs> Sitting beside me, this beautiful blonde, here is my executive secretary, Susie Thayer. Stand up, Susie. <laughs> so she'll accept your $50 dues if you brought them today. <coughs> and I'd like to do, introduce Adam Van Gelder. He's the guy in the dark shoot, suit next to the video. Adam is my aerial drone guy. And he's videotaping the presentation today. So you don't have to remember all the numbers. We're going to put them on Clark website and on Andy Ron's website. So you'll have the whole presentation. First, I want to thank uh, Northwest Montana Farm Credit Services. For sponsoring lunch. Well, that was a good lunch. Second, I want to say a one word prayer for 2018. Ebenezer. That translates to God was with us. My prayer for 2019 is may the Lord always be with us. Amen. Scott Poe, come on up. If you sponsor lunch, we give you time to talk. <laughs> Thanks, Don. Once again, let's give a round of applause for Don and Susie that organized this. I also want to just thank Clark and, and the other presenters that put all this material together. Um, and, and I just want to give a, a, a quick introduction to a couple of our staff that are here. Uh, Samantha matlack Folkman is in the back. She does a lot of our home loans. Carrie Graham. Um, Flip Zarin is here from our Great Falls area. Tyler Tinsman. Uh, in addition to Jim and Roll, anybody I'm missing? I think that's it. So we, we appreciate our relationship with all of you and wish you the best for this year. So just a couple of things I, I was going to cover. You know, this this uh, first slide just represents uh, the top ten economies that contribute to the world's GDP. And, you know, with everything going on in the world and domestically, I just thought it was kind of an interesting slide. Um, 
with all of our challenges in the U.S., we're still the leader, with contributing to about 20, 25% of GDP, followed by China, Japan, Germany, the U.K., India, France, Brazil, Italy, and Canada, kind of round out the top 10. Between those 10, that's two-thirds of the overall GDP in the world. You know, the U.S. is now the world's largest energy producer, and our economy has been on a roll for the past 10 years with uh, 120 months in a row of economic expansion. As you know, in 17, our, our uh, stock market returned 20%, but then was down 14% since October, so we've seen some volatility and a few storm clouds on the horizon. Some are expecting a little higher probability of, of recession and, and some global slowdown, um, some trade issues, and potentially inverted yield curve with short-term rates being higher than long-term. But uh, overall, I think we've got a lot to be thankful for living here in the U.S. Um, this, this next slide, just we get a lot of questions about interest rates, and this reflects the probability of whether rates will move or not. So this is the Federal Open Market Committee rates, which right now is at 2.5%, which equates to a 5.5% prime. So the, the section in the middle there that's, that's outlined is the probability that rates will remain as is. For those next meeting dates so as you can see you know pretty strong probability they're not going to move um, there's even some talk of potentially rates going down with some, with some concerns about recession and some other things but you know initially the fed had <coughs> indicated that there would be a couple more rate hikes on short-term rates they're kind of backing away from that and there'll be some more comments coming out on that today This next chart is uh, a pretty good indicator of long-term rates, and as you can see, um, since 2015, we, we saw a pretty good drop, well, well below 2%. Uh, then we popped over 3% on the on the 10-year, and now we're down right around 2.7. So, uh, long-term rates have, have uh, dropped off a little bit. But that's a pretty good indicator of long-term rates. You know, as far as a little closer to home, uh, when it comes to our leading industry being agriculture, obviously prices and weather are a big factor. Um, I think last year I showed the slide of Taylor Brown's ranch in eastern Montana that had just been on fire. I mean, in 17, we had a very dry year. Western Montana, not so, not so much, but not great. 18 overall was very good. We are starting the year in, a, in a kind of a dry period, it looks like. Uh, although as we speak, Montana and parts of Wyoming are really the only 10 western states that aren't mostly under drought. But our snowpack, I think the Gallatin is, is right about normal, but the other drainages, Madison and, and moving to the rest of the west are, are under normal. So. Uh, we, we get a lot of information from Eric Snodgrass, who's a meteorologist, and, and he is predicting, at least through the next month, fairly mild and, and a little less than normal precip. so hopefully that's wrong. But as always in Montana, we have to wait into the early spring to see, see what's going to transpire. As far as uh, Montana ag, uh, there's... 27,100 farms in the state, an average of, of 2,200 acres. There, it's getting so there's 67 farmers markets now. So that's, you know, that local food movement has really gained ground, not just in markets like Bozeman and Missoula, Helena, Great Falls, and Billings, but in a lot of real small communities. So that's been kind of an interesting trend to watch. It's still our leading industry with 4.6 billion in revenue, and Montana is a national leader when it comes to products such as wheat, barley, dried peas, lentils, flax, 
I mean, as far as our top 10 products, cattle and calves still lead uh, with about two and a half million head uh, in, a, in a state that has about a population of just over a million. Uh, the cattle market stayed reasonably stronger longer this year, but you know, has, has, has dropped off considerably this fall. Our cull prices are, are down considerably in relation to the value of the calves. Part of that is, is some pressure from the, from the dairy liquidations that are going on with the lower dairy prices. Uh, next is wheat. Uh, Montana's, I believe, second in the nation for, for all wheat um, between spring and winter. Um, hay is, is number three. Most of our hay is produced for feed in the state. We do get quite a bit exported to other states and even some areas internationally. Uh, barley would be the next next commodity. Lentils, dried peas, sugar beets, chickpeas or garbanzos, and potatoes. And then our oil seeds, flaxseed, safflower, and canola kind of round out the top 10. So as far as information needed for, for your clients that are pursuing financing, um, you know, kind of falls into three categories. The first is the borrower information, which uh, is pretty obvious, but we need to understand is it an entity, individual, uh, a group of individuals, uh, husband and wife, one or the other. Uh, the next is the financial information, which can be pretty simple, typically on loans, under a million dollars, you know, the financial requirements are, are less, um, but that but it kind of has degrees of complexity based on the customer. And then finally, the property information, which we're used to working with all of you on, uh, which, which typically accounts for the buy-sell, uh, which we, we need to understand the timelines and timeframes and contingencies with that. Legal description, which we which we uh, typically work with you on getting a preliminary title report going as, as soon as possible to ensure access. You know, is it fee simple or is there an easement uh, on the property? Water rights uh, information, which can be again fairly simple in a lot of cases, but otherwise it's it, it can often be a little more complex and, and involves some due diligence, and then, you know, whether it's an owner, owner in a ditch company or um, just tied to the land, and then buildings, buildings and improvements that are located on the property. So for us, you know, a, a number of, of considerations we have, we can do customized structures. Uh, typical amortizations for us are five to 25 years, probably catches most of our just ag loans. We set our payments monthly, quarterly, and or semi-annually. Uh, we can do fully fixed. A fixed to conversion is a product that we do a lot uh, where we could do a 20 year am and then we could lock the rate for three, five, seven, 10 or 15 years and then it'll revert back to a variable and the customer can then lock it in for the remaining or for another fixed period of time without having to come back and renegotiate any fees or anything else uh, and then variable. Uh, Samantha that, uh, that I mentioned does country home and lot loans. Those don't have any acreage restrictions so it can be a home on 50 acres uh, or it could be a home on a smaller acreage. It can include barns, shops, outbuildings, writing arenas, or income producing properties, custom modular log and manufactured, and also all-in-one construction loans. And on those, we can do up to 80% financing. And then those are portfolioed, so those are kept in-house rather than being sold in the secondary market, which, which is really nice if you ever have any servicing or boundary line adjustments or any kind of modifications to the loan. 
Another area that we do, we're, we're the leading insurance, crop insurance provider in the Northwest. You know, just some of the products that we offer through that. And then just this past year, we acquired a couple of more firms in, in the state of Montana. Uh, but multi peril named peril revenue-based, uh, whole farm revenue, pasture and rangeland insurance is something that we've seen a lot of interest in some people that don't even produce a crop but but own a chunk of ground uh, can can look into pasture and range land insurance production cost insurance and then livestock we do a lot of our equipment through a program called act direct that we work with a lot of dealers on it's got an easy application quick decisions um, it can be for purchase, lease, or refinance. We can go two to seven years on equipment, and then up to 10 years on pivots. And then as far as our appraisers, uh, Jim and Roll that you're, he'll, you will hear from, as well as Harvin is here, uh, we can do appraisals. Uh, typically they're for in-house use for farm credit customers or for FSA they do do some for other lenders uh, they can also do appraisals for estates or estate planning and also for business planning and then finally on our on our ag loans um, you know as a financial cooperative we take a portion of our earnings and return it return it to our customers and that's accounted for 1% over the last three years. So last year that was right at $100 million for our customers. This year that our board just approved it at a higher level. So the, the checks for our customers will actually exceed that this year at 1.25%. So with that, I just again want to thank Clark and, and all of you and the presenters, and we look forward to working with you this year. Please holler if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Um, is that what I was gonna say? Anyway, um, welcome everybody, and we're honored to be here again and be asked to come back. Uh, I've been able to assemble a panel again this year. I think you'll find interesting. We're not only going to be covering stuff in the farm ranch sector, but we'll be looking at some uh, micro stuff in the Gallatin Valley on housing and subdivision and some of those things. I apologize in advance that when I assembled these people, you know, they've got a lot of information, and we're going to try and hold our presentations to 10 to 12 minutes apiece, but we're going to be an hour and a half. Um, and next year, hopefully, we'll, we might try and do it for credit next year and go a little longer and then have an open bar afterwards. <laughs> we didn't quite get that done. But um, so, just so you people are familiar, Andy Ron, Montana Land Source. Andy and I worked together early on, and he was a GIS and appraisal and he's back in the GIS world. Um, Andy graduated from Humboldt with a degree in science. He went to Humboldt. MSU, Soil Science and Land Resource. And Andy's going to talk about his company and also some statistics. Rolled with Farm Credit Services, a Montana boy, raised on the High Line, and uh, graduated from Missoula with a degree in finance and an MBA. Jim Wiley, who's been with Farm Credit, which was a uh, federal land bank when he started in BCA <laughs> back in the day, graduated from University of Idaho with a degree in Ag Econ. He's in ARA, he's been in the field almost as long as 40 years. I think this is 41 years for me this year. Bruce, who's our Penn State graduate with an accounting degree, has been in Montana for 20 some years and been involved in a lot of sketchy things. But <laughs> <laughs> a lot of subdivision, land use planning, litigation support, I mean Bruce that is the analytical mind that uh, we all rely on to help us try and understand things. Katie's new, um, Mary, sorry, Mary Catherine, she, know? she went to the University of the South, and she tells me it's called Swami, but Swami, yeah. So um, she's been appraising residential with Jerry Gossel and appraisal services for 
the last eight years, and she's going to be working with us to help her to get towards her general license. Um, and she's going to be covering some of the Down Valley stuff. Her mom's an MAI back east, so she was raised in an appraisal household, so she's got a long appraisal understanding. Tom Kingsbury, as you guys know, he's our that was our tech, now Tom has his own company, part and parcel, he still contracts with us, but he'll be discussing some of the advanced GIS things that he's been working on, and um, he graduated from MSU and his family, although he who was raised in Minnesota, his family has a really interesting early background in Montana agriculture. His great-grandfather bought some of the first sheep in the state. And Mike, biggest change this year, he went to the dark side, so he came from Hall and Hall, to Norman C. Wheeler and Associates. So now Mike's working with us in the Bozeman office here, and Pork's still in the Missoula office. And Mike um, came from the South on horse. And the thing I appreciate about Mike, he spent a lot of time working on big outfits before he finally figured out he should get an education. He's graduated from MSU with a, uh, a degree in ag finance and a master's degree in animal science. But he spent a lot of time on the back of a horse, and he's good at thinking about things for a period of time. You know, so, so I find that really useful. Um, but I, I added it up, you know, and people always talk, well, we got 160 some hours or something like that of experience here now. So, years. Yeah, hours. Credit hours. Years. Years. Yeah, years. 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 Yes, years. And, you know, so we're trying to broaden a little bit. You know, we tend to think that Montana is the center of the universe, but Jim's going to give us some presentation on the Northwest. and. You know, it's surprising to see what values are in other areas. And we're going to talk about Montana and Idaho and some Wyoming. So some of the, you know, it basically is the Montana roundup, but we're trying to make it a little more rounder for you. So that being said, I always like to start uh, with the passing notes of anybody in our community of people that has passed. I don't think we came up with anybody this year. So, um, like I said, we got lucky this year. It's <laughs> really, really more. Yeah, he's, he's worth my dad. He's an old timer. Um, so, but that said, I'm, you, know, I'm, you know, we've all had losses over the years. So, blessings to to everybody that's had to deal with that. Of course, uh, thank you, to Don, the Orange King. We call him Susie. If you're the Orange King, then she's a Vanka. I don't know how that works. <laughs> <laughs> so, he's never going to give up. Um, and Northwest Farm Credit Services sponsors, you know, the, the ranch broker sponsored the room. The Farm Credit Services sponsors the meal. And these panel members give their time. And, you know, we always thank the brokers and everybody that helps us, you know, in our business. So uh, we went through that. Next year, like I said, we may try and do this for CD credit. If you're looking for CD credit, our Appraisal Institute or Appraisal Society here in Montana has a 16 credit hours for appraisers and real estate people next month. There's some handouts up here, and you can talk to Jim and Roll. I had those uh, lists I passed around people's emails, so feel free to contact people about that. So, to get started, we always have to have our disclaimer. We're not talking about any specific properties. This is not an appraisal. This is information that you can do with it what you want. And it's interesting, we've got different appraisers, we've got different data sets, you're gonna hear conflicting information, different ideas and opinions. So I got to looking at this picture, it's down on outside of Laramie on the freeway, and I was thinking, that's kind of like the appraisal process. You know, there we go. The subject property, we're heading into this storm. You know, here's the van full of secret information from all the brokers. <laughs> if we're gonna take with us in there, trying to figure out, you know, that's our sale data. And as my dad always taught me, the appraisal is you go out and gather all the facts and then you go back to the hotel room and you figure out how to distort it. So, <laughs> so that's how I was raised, and that was before appraisal licensing. So um, these guys tend to be a little more ethical. Um, <laughs> but anyway, when I get done, you know, I do my appraisal, and, and then my data comes out, and bang, look what we got. That's that's what I like to see, something shiny and expensive. So, <laughs> yeah. But that kind of leads to one of the points we'll talk about today, is that if you want to buy a jet, there's price discovery. You know what it's going to cost, and there's jets to be bought. We're dealing in a market, as you guys know, that there's limited supply. There's 
different kinds of jets. Nobody really knows what they're worth. And the people that are buying these, rarely do we do an appraisal for people buying a ranch. It's usually well after the fact. So these people buying ranches, they're paying cash, and they're being motivated by a story. It's not a number that motivates these people, it's the story. And for a lot of these people, it's the dream. You know, the dream of having a ranch and, and what that's gonna lead to. And when my dad was alive back in the 80s, he used to say, it took five years for people to take the cure. They'd buy a big ranch, and after about five years, they were out of it. But the people that buy ranches now have very deep resources and a different land ethic, I think. And I'll just touch on that today. But the average hold time that I see on big ranches, $20 million and over over the last 20 years, is 20 years. People are not buying these properties and reselling them. In fact, many of these people, as we all know, are buying them and enlarging them. So it's a different kind of market. but. That's why it tends to be somewhat confusing. So this year, I'm going to let Mike carry the, the ball in the value data, and I'm going to talk more about some of the special projects we're working on, just to give people an idea of what the real appraisal business is these days. We're working on a 650,000-acre sage bay grouse mitigation bank, for valuation of mitigation credits. We're doing cost analysis for owners on stream restoration, irrigation, redevelopment, so they have ratios that if if I go from real move to pivot, you know, besides the capital costs, am I going to have recovery? You know, am I going to sell this property or get it appraised or borrow money? Um, we're working in wetland mitigation models, valuations for different wetland credits, stream credits. We're always working on conservation easement information. We're working on some specialized agricultural infrastructure appraisals that Mike's going to talk about. Where uh, I'll let him talk about that. We've been studying the obsolescence issues related to non-conforming houses. When people have their dream, that is not their dream. They want that 10,000 or 20,000 acres, but they don't want that. And these have been problematic to us for several years. We're seeing that, so if you have a $500,000 ranch house, when you sell the property, typically we'd say you get $350,000, $400,000 back on your investment. These babies uh, now are shown about a 65% loss. So you get 35 cents back on the dollar. And the last couple sales we've seen this year, it's more than 80%. I don't even know if there was a value on some of these five, six, seven million dollar houses. But you know, you gotta remember too that, so I got a seven million dollar house and it's only worth two, but it's in a $30 million transaction. So it all gets kind of confusing. But they look at these as a depreciating asset. That's not what they're buying the property. We've done a special project for the state of Montana, which we'll be updating this year. It's five and a half million acres of state land, almost 13,000 parcels that, as you know, are spread throughout the state. They're in the red. And we created a geo database program, GIS database, with Thomas's help, where state employees, they can click on any one of those sections. And they get a basic data box for that area that gives them land values, not necessarily specific to that property, but in that area. So they're using that for planning and uh, moving forward, and that's been an interesting project. And that's based on a lot of submarkets and farm credit services helped on that. We're continuing studies of subdivision. You can see on this property where these properties were bought, and then they were subsequently subdivided through minor subdivision or boundary alignment. They're not being subdivided to be sold, but we're advising clients, you know, let's get this property in the tracks because in the future. You're not going to be able to do that, or if you want to do a conservation easement, things like that. And then parcel density, too, if you're looking there. Uh, like around Belgrade, we've been studying through our interpolations. We'll talk about those, Thomas, you know, where, where the density of development is and where you're expecting it to flow. Structural studies, um, again, using the GIS data, we can go in and show that this, this piece of property, which is going under conservation easement, is in a neighborhood where you have these million dollar houses according to the assessment. You know, and it shows that the development potential of that property is 300, you know, 160s, 320s, with a two or three million dollar house on it, not, not subdivided it into 20 acre tracks. Um, our interpolation studies, the color's not too good here this year, I apologize, but you've seen these before, the sides are better than the front ones. Where in 2010 to 14, we were studying the river corridor, twin bridges, we can see these areas of value, red being the hottest, orange 
yellow, green, the lowest, that we would anticipate those would join up. And by 2018, you can see that due to subsequent sales in here, that whole river corridor now lights up to a higher value. So people find that useful in anticipating market movement. Um, conservation easements, we're still working on easements in the rural areas. We're in the 25 to 35% takedown usually. In the urban projects, the urban projects, we're still seeing that uh, higher value, 35 to 60%. There's been the federal programming through the ALE program, which has provided up to 75% of market value. These are not IRS appraisals, so they have a little more flexibility to them. So a lot of the easements we see going on now are, are landowners that are selling easements. They're not donating easements for uh, tax purposes. They're getting paid for it. And in Gallatin County, some people have been paid as much as 90% of the value. This is a study in the Paradise Valley that shows that that market ran up in 2008 and it's never come back. In fact, it's still dropping. And so these kind of markets, you know, you look to conservation easements, that was the speculative component of the market that the easement would strip away. But now that we don't have this escalated value in some of these markets, conservation easements aren't doing so well in some of these outlying markets. But in areas like the Gallatin Valley, you look at the average, you take the development sales out, and you've got this pretty consistent, jeez, sorry, I keep hitting the wrong button. Well, you think I would never have done this before. Okay, I just gave away the whole thing. So. <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> My time was up. <laughs> it's been pretty consistent for, you know, these are average size deeded tracks through the years. That has been pretty consistent. The development stuff, you know, in 2006, $34,000 an acre was what people were paying PAWS and those kind of people for that stuff. And people buying development ground today are paying $13,000 an acre. But you can see that's, that gives you a conservation play. If you have property people are buying for easement or for development and you put an easement on it, somewhere in that value range, it hits it right off. We'll talk about our east-west study, that weird appendage is the Wilkes effect pushing values out in that country for elk habitat. And then we have all these markets. So that's why the averages don't always really make a lot of sense. But in the Western survey this year, we're at 2,066. We have broken the grass, glass ceiling, as I call it, $2,000 an acre for average over 640 acre properties. And then part of what's, we talk about in this market, we have tier one properties. Those are the mountain, river, fishing. Tier two properties, tier three properties. Tier one and two properties tend to be valued on an overall per acre, regardless of whether they have irrigated cropland or not. Tier two and tier three tend to be valued, you know, croplands, one value, rangelands, something else, um, dry croplands, something else. And they tend to have, have these kind of value ranges associated with them. Um, in 2017, we saw a few of these high dollar sales. We saw nine of them this year that were over $2,000 an acre, 6,500 uh, acres a piece. You know, we only saw two of those in 16. We saw three in 17. This market is really hyper uh, inflated in this upper end right now. And these kind of properties, when you look at those, average days on market, 70. And some of those weren't even on the market. And you look at the whole period, it's like we were talking about, 19.7 years is how long those people had those crops before they exposed them. So that's really driving the market. In the over $20 million market over the last 20 years, like I said, 19.3 years is the average hold time. Yellowstone Club, um, let's close on that. <coughs> this is what they're reporting on the street. $950 million in real estate sales in 2018. So, I mean, if you want to be in the real estate business, that's where you should be. That's my best joke of the day. <laughs> These are lifestyle buyers. They're under 45 years old. The ranch market was $520 million, so you know it's dwarfed by that. The average buyer has a land ethic and is 55. We've talked about that before. So, so anyway, in closing, just one of the things that's made it very difficult to be an appraiser in this day is because of the changing nature of the people buying ranches. Um, so I'm glad I'm about to be out of the business, but I was just going to play this little video.
Yo, Vic. It's Clark. You don't return Johnny's phone calls? You don't return Joe's call? What did you say? <laughs> I'm only the appraiser. <laughs> As Clark said, we're going to expand your horizons a little bit today, and uh, you're going to see probably more statistics and data analysis probably to last you till this time next year, I imagine. <laughs> anyway, I thought this was a pretty good quote. He uses statistics as a drunken man uses a lamppost for support rather than illumination. I don't know if we'll illuminate you, but we'll try. I'm going to talk about the territory that Northwest Farm Credit covers here, Montana, Idaho, Oregon, and Washington. And I'm going to pick a couple areas in there and, and give you some details. We also cover Alaska, but I don't think there's very many land transactions up there. That's mostly fisheries. Semi-annually, we do a market study, a land value trend survey, we call it, and we take all of our data and compile this information. And we also ask our appraisers who are scattered out across the whole Northwest for their comments on what's happening in their particular area. Now, as you can see right here from 2010, it's been a pretty steady upward trend for land values. The solid black line is the number of transactions which has been going down since 2015. One thing to keep in mind, as you can see at the top, this is all transactions 40 acres and above. So this is a very, very broad view, okay? That, that could include 40 acres of blueberries in Oregon and 4,000 acres of pasture in Weibo, Montana. So there's a lot, of, a lot of different properties in there, but we've maintained the same format just so we can compare year to year and I think it still does give you some indication of the trends. This graph is previous data, but split out by state. Montana is at the bottom there, and as you can see over that 10 year period, Montana is pretty flat compared to the other three states. One thing you'll notice too, since, well, in the last year, Washington and Montana show a slight decrease. And I guess we're judging that that's more a function of a higher percent of lower quality properties being in the data than it is an actual downward trend because none of our particular areas report lower values at this point. So here are the common trends. Overall, still studied slightly higher. Demand is still strong, particularly for large tracts. Supply of good quality properties is limited. We are hearing in various places across the Northwest some softening of rental rates. So I picked a couple of areas we'll talk about in more detail. This is Eastern Washington, basically all the counties east of the Cascades. And here's your value ranges. <clears throat> these are, as it says at the bottom, these are not all encompassing. In other words, there's probably sales above the high end and below the low end, but the majority of properties would fall in these ranges, okay? Mm -hmm. Irrigated crop, pivot irrigated crop, 9,000 to 16. Non-pivot, 5 to 11, and so on. You can see the Dry crop, the first dry, whoops, I'm doing the same thing, Clark. Find my arrow. This dry crop would be the Palouse, which is probably, well, I would say for sure the best dry crop land in the West, where they can annual crop it. And of course, those kind of properties don't even come on the market very often, but keep those figures in mind when, uh, <clears throat> Rolled starts giving you some figures for Montana. 
This is the Central Washington Orchards area. Um, this is where the majority of apples, cherries, pears, vineyards, all that sort of thing are, are grown. Just to show you some values here. Apple and cherry orchards, 12 to 22,000 an acre. In the second category there, the irrigated crop. This would be irrigated cropland that has historically been row crops like potatoes and corn and that sort of thing, where they'll come in and they'll buy those properties and then establish orchards. And actually there's been quite a bit of that in the last few years because those are high, high dollar crops but also there's a lot more risk. Um, blueberries has become a big thing in Washington. We're not gonna talk about Oregon, but hazelnuts in Oregon, the same thing's happening with that. You like my transition? <laughs> Pretty cool, huh? Okay, Clark and I talked about this particular sale that might be of interest to you. This closed in September, this past September. It was just short of 171 million, total of 19,000 plus <coughs> acres, of which 18,386 was deeded land, so 92.89 an acre. It's a good block, solid block, contiguous, and 130 pivots. Um, the, the seller was John Hancock Life Insurance, who'd owned the property since 2010. The buyer went by an LLC name of 100C, which is composed of Angelina Agriculture Company from Louisiana. But they also have a Kirtland, Washington address, which, uh, let's see, who lives in Seattle, Kirtland? John Gate, or, Bill Gates. Yeah, Bill Gates is allegedly a partner in this deal. And one source tells me the real motive in this purchase was just wealth preservation. It is being farmed by a farm management company. It was not listed for sale. It actually came to John Hancock. Let's transition to Idaho. <clears throat> our closest neighbors and let's first look at Eastern that'd be Idaho Falls, Blackfoot, Pocatello and then kind of the ranch and recreation country up here in Lamai and Custer here you're seeing um, irrigated crop and this is all irrigated crop 2750 to 8000 and they're saying pretty much everything is stable to slightly increasing. We jump over to the <clears throat> Magic Valley area, which is Twin Falls, um, Rupert, Burley, Gooding, that area. Of course, this is a really big dairy area, the biggest in the Northwest. And Mike's going to talk a little bit more about some of that. Here it jumps up a little on the irrigated crop from five to 10,000. You can see the range land, 350 to 1,000. And they're also saying this is stable to slightly increasing. And then if we jump over to the Treasure Valley, which is the Boise area, Caldwell, this is a very, there's all kinds of varieties of crops growing in this area, almost like Washington but you'll notice the values are almost the same as Twin Falls, five to 10,000, which <clears throat> kind of surprises me because Boise is a lot like Bozeman, things are booming there again. I would have thought some of this might be a little higher, but it is what it is. Like that transition? Okay. <laughs> I have a good friend that works for a large institution investment company where they manage a very big portfolio of, of investments. A lot of it are uh, retirement funds, that sort of thing. And a significant amount of their portfolio is invested in agriculture. 
for him, he covers the Northwest, but most of their investment has been in Idaho and Washington with some in Oregon. He says they're very active. In fact, he said they've been, he's been as busy as ever the last six months. They're willing to pay market value, not always the top price. They're most interested in very large irrigated farms, just like the one sale in Southern Washington. They also have investments in uh, orchards. Of course, just like everyone, I guess they prefer very good quality properties. Typically what they'll do is lease them back for two to three year periods <clears throat> on a cash basis for row crops. And they, uh, they usually do a percentage of gross for orchards. Their whole period normally is about 10 years. He says they're willing to accept a lower return than they have in the past of about four to four and a quarter percent versus five in the past. And one thing, you know, he's, he's always looked at Montana, but if you look at the uh, possibilities in Montana, I don't think you can find very many cases where you're gonna get a four and a quarter percent return, <clears throat> you know. Plus the other thing is we don't have the large contiguous irrigated tracks. You know, the closest we have is probably dry crop in the triangle or ranch, you know, big ranch properties. <clears throat> Excuse me. And those are not going to return four and a quarter percent. He did say, too, they have a lot of money in the queue. So they're still looking for property. This is kind of random, but this showed up in the Wall Street Journal last month. And I didn't, I didn't copy the whole story here. You can read through it. Basically, the Harvard Endowment has $39 billion, <clears throat> and they've become interested in agricultural properties. And in this case, this is down in uh, Southern California, close to San Luis Obispo. And they came in starting in 2012 and started putting together these tracks of irrigated agricultural property. And the bottom line seems to be they're as interested in the water as they are in the land. This happens to be in a basin where the aquifer hasn't lowered as much as a lot of other places in California. So Harvard, I guess, thinks that water may be a long-term investment opportunity. I think they put together 3,000 acres Plus they acquired a nearby ranch property of 8,700 acres. So it's significant. And they've come in and started drilling wells. I think they've drilled 12 so far, which kind of upsets the locals. Because the locals are feeling that they're trying to control the water in that whole basin. Random trivia question. Where's 99% of U.S. hops produced? Kind of gave you a clue with the area of covering, right? Look at this transition. <laughs> 99% of U.S. hops is produced in the Northwest. And 75% of that is in Washington, mostly in around Yakima. In conclusion, if you torture the data long enough, it will confess. And we, we torture the data. You'll see. And I'll finish with this. I said it's totally accurate. <laughs> with that, I'll turn it over to Mike. I only got a little part here, but we thought it'd be interesting, I guess, to show you guys some differences. Uh, they're talking about agriculture in Montana being a pretty big component of our economy. We do quite a bit of work in outlying states. I've worked in Idaho, uh, specifically like the Magic Valley. Um, <clears throat> dairy's a pretty big influence down there, but the migrational factors in Idaho aren't as significant as we see here in Montana. 
Agriculture is uh, really the primary influence. Uh, irrigated lands are really in demand. There's quite a few. Uh, where you guys can't hear me. Anyway, there's uh, institutional investors, as Jim talked about, row crop producers, and dairy is a big a deal. Uh, dairy here, obviously, I guess if you have a subscription to the Chronicle, dairy is not doing very good in the Gallatin Valley. <clears throat> but it is, the Gallatin Valley is the number one county uh, for dairy. There's like 13,000 cows in the whole state of Montana, dairy cows. <clears throat> this barn, the Idaho barn milks uh, 15 or 17,000, all of that one site. So the Montana dairy up there is like a double eight parallel system. You can get 16 cows in at one time. The Idaho dairy has 206 head rotaries, so you can get 212 cows. Uh, the other rotary is off to the side here, you can't see it. Um, so I mean, it's a lot different. So I mean, I guess you can see why these smaller dairies up here are struggling a little bit. Uh, these guys will buy smaller dairies, and use their permits uh, to do things like heifer development or house dry cows. Uh, but this deal is a pretty interesting place. I mean, it's pretty sophisticated. That tower you see in the middle is like a, um, you know, they monitor these dairies. I mean, you can see the two rotaries out the windows. Uh, there's monitors here. I couldn't get in a picture. Uh, but the technology on these deals are pretty, pretty wild. Uh, what's that? Uh, it's going towards Utah. There, um, at any rate, it's pretty significant. This guy. I mean, it's, they're all about trying to lower the unit cost. So they're getting bigger. Like this particular barn is going to expand. Uh, this is their new plans. There's two freestyle barns. They've since eliminated one, but those 2,496 long, feet long barns were freestyle barns. And initially, they able to house 20,000 cows under roof, uh, and then they come into this milk barn uh, where it's going to be about four of those 106 head rotaries. Um, that's going to allow them to milk like 36,500 cows, is what their permit restrictions do. Um, but this place sits on a section of ground with pins and whatnot. They develop heifers and calves. So um, they built this feed center, like these barn coming off of the coming off the building right here. It's going to be a ramp. Semis will drive up and over commodity bays and dump. I mean, a full size semi drives through that building uh, over commodity bays and then dumps their commodity in a specific spot. And kind of allows them to be more efficient, never slow down feeders. But so, I mean, when we talk about ag in Montana, and you, Think about, I mean, obviously the, the dairy industry is a big contrast, I guess, between Idaho and Montana. But, uh, you know, recreational, I guess, really is what we're really looking at in this part of Montana. So that was, I guess, just some random information. We'll end it off the Andy now. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, I'd like to uh, thank Don and the brokerage group again, and uh, thanks Clark for opening this up to the rest of us appraisers. It's really a joy to all work together and collaborate. We don't always get to do that enough. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, Montana Land Source subscribers um, for supporting the venture and making it possible. It's a, it's a fun project. So for those of you who aren't familiar with Montana Land Source, uh, we consider ourselves the most comprehensive source for the large acreage land market in Montana. Um, what we do, we track and map all available listings in Montana, 200 acres and up, and, and put them on a map. Uh, we update this data daily, put it all on a searchable map, uh, along with some other great map data like parcels and hunting districts and public lands and wildfire data and all kinds of, all kinds of neat stuff. Um, and what's become really valuable uh, by our clients is we publish an email every week that shows everything that's new. So there's really no other better resource for staying on top of the market and knowing what comes on the market and sells and, and whatnot. Um, and then increasingly, we're compiling and sharing market statistics, which, is, which has been really fun and interesting. Uh, just to run down who uses Montana Land Source, primarily rural real estate professionals. Um, by far, mostly land brokers and agents. And Kind of got a list up there or some logos. Apologize if I uh, didn't get up there. Only had so much room. If you're in the room, and you're not up there. But also appraisers, lenders, attorneys, land trusts, land consultants, government agencies, and increasingly, uh, land buyers and land sellers are finding us and finding out about us. Um, our primary marketing goes towards professionals, but uh, we're a great resource for anybody that owns land or wants to stay up on the market. We have some new developments uh, coming down the line. Main thing is we're gonna have a free version for the first time. 
We've always been a subscription-based service, and you've got to subscribe to really have any access, but we're going to create a free version with uh, not as much information, of course, but, but some good information. And now, instead of having to wait for the email once a week, we're going to put it live on our website. So um, every time a property gets mapped, every time something hits the market, sells, we're going to have a running uh, list on the, on the website, which is going to be fun. Uh, and again, real-time market statistics on that website. Um, the weekly email market updates will be available to non-subscribers as well. And the free public version is opening up a whole new thing for us, which is property advertising. We think that the, it's wide open, really, for uh, online advertising venue for Montana properties, that that segment of the market is not really currently being served very well. So keep an eye out for that, and feel free to talk to me about those opportunities, those of you that have properties to advertise. Um, this is kind of gonna, what it's going to look like on our, on our website. I don't think you can see this very well, but we're going to have you know, new properties up with some basic information, including you know, whether it was a sale or pending or new listing or whatever, with, with uh, up-to-the-date dates, which is, is really exciting. It's just a screenshot of all the properties we have mapped, sales, listings, whatnot, so it's, it's getting pretty dense. Pretty, pretty exciting. Um, so talking about current market statistics. So as I have said, you know, Montana Land Source maps 200 acres and greater. Um, the total number of active listings as of yesterday or so is 595. We always hover about 600 is about average for how many listings are on the market at any one time. The percent of listings that have had price changes is 31%. Um, one thing, uh, Exciting thing about Montana Land Source, um, as appraisers, we're typically beholden to sales and sale prices, and obviously sales are comps, and that's what appraisal is based on. A really interesting, exciting thing about Montana Land Source, having access to all this listing is very interesting. Um, I've always felt for years, you know, sales and sale prices are really only part of the information that's out there. And one thing I think we all struggle with. Especially, you know, we get a couple strong sales. Does that really define the market or not? Uh, and what doesn't sell and what happens with listings and whatnot is, is really interesting information. So currently on the market today, 31% of those properties have experienced a price reduction. The average of that price reduction is 23%. Average days on the market is 572 days, and that's up 21% from this time last year. So properties are, are staying on the market a little longer. Total number of acres listed, 1.2 million. Average acreage of properties are to 2,100 acres. Average land price, so these are, these are either properties without improvements or a few properties where we teased out improvement value. Average land price on the market right now is $3,000 an acre. Total sum of all the price, uh, properties on the market, all those list prices, $2 billion. Did a little breakdown of um, the acreages. So as you'd expect, you know, higher percentages of 200, 200, 200 to 400 acres, about 38%. 400 to 1,000 acres, 29%. 1,000 to 5,000 acres, 24%, gets smaller percentages as we get higher acres. So as you'd expect, higher percentages of small acreage properties on the market. And then the same thing by value breakdown. So where do we start? We start here at 100,000 to 500, the low end of the market. About 14% in that range. 500 to a million, about 20%. Biggest bulk is actually a million to 25, uh, to 2.5 million. At just shy of 30% of the market. 2.5 to 5, 19%, 5 to 10, 11%, greater than $10 million is 8% of the current listing market. So the number of listings going into 2008, so a year ago today, like I shared earlier, we hovered around 600 properties, so 600 properties on the market. During the year, 424 properties came on the market. So at any one time in 2018, there was about 1,000 properties on the market. Of that, 
194 sold. So 19% of all those properties are what sold. And uh, this, to me, has been the shocker of the presentation. 236 of those properties went off the market. 23% of those properties go off the market. And then the remainder is what carries over and is still on the market, just shy of 60%. And here's a graph showing that. So, big takeaway, less than 20% of listings each year, well, based on 2018, less than 20% of listings <coughs> sell. Over 20% of listings expire or withdrawn. And where this, kind of where this came from, and it's gotten so interesting, so many of the calls I get, either from brokers or sometimes landowners, sellers, and pricing, talking about pricing, some of this data, the motivation for digging this up has been for resources for brokers going to the kitchen table to talk about pricing. Of course, what most sellers, the information they have access to is the advertising and the land magazine and you know what the ask prices are over there. Like Clark mentioned, you know we don't have a lot of discovery in the market, so that's what people's information is. This kind of information, how, how few properties sell, essentially. More properties are taken off the market than sell. That was pretty uh, pretty shocking to me, anyway. So that's my first presentation. Who's next? Hey, let me have a second. So, thank you. I'm sorry. My <laughs> I'll be covering the Montana land studies. Something Clark's traditionally done. We do have a newsletter. I don't know if Clark mentioned it. It'll be on our website, but we got some hard copies up here if you want it. Uh, this deals with 600 property, 640 acres in size and larger. This is going to be the whole, the whole stage where we're going to look at first, then we'll move to the western Montana market area. Uh, we've got a, the volume is what we're looking at here is transactions, uh, volume in terms of total dollars, gigan acres, and then we have the average dollar per acre sales price. Um, 2018 is pretty good, 139 transactions, down slightly at 15%, you know, when compared to 163 that we have in 2017. Our dollar volume at 500. 20 million uh, down slightly from the 595 or 595 million in 2017. Uh, deeded, deeded acres did fall substantially at 42%. I think it's partly just due to the fact that uh, we don't have a lot of those large properties available. Uh, but we did see an increase in the average dollar per acre sales price. Now, this is unimproved land value. I uh, tried to extract the building contributory value and just report the land value here. That's up 26% in this particular data set. I think the increase in the average that we're seeing here is largely attributable uh, to the market activity in western Montana. Uh, it counts about 60% of our data in this particular set. We look at <coughs> volume. Uh, this is looking at the <coughs> deeded acres sold. We break the transactions up into various categories. We have four different size categories here. Uh, as you <coughs> might imagine, the property is 10,000 acres in size and greater. Uh, do represent a pretty small fraction of the market. It's just due to scarcity. I mean, there just tends to be less available at any given time. Uh, if you compare this to 2017 and 2018, uh, you see there wasn't a lot of change in that particular dynamic. Uh, the larger properties, we did have less of the 10,000 acres and larger. Um, but <clears throat> properties that are 2,000 acres in size and, and smaller did uh, represent about 67% of the market in 2018, which is comparable to what we saw in 2017 at 65%. Uh, I guess that's not been <coughs> earth shattering. Uh, then we look at uh, transactions in terms of the dollar, break it up in, as far as price points. Uh, you see those properties selling at price points between a million and three million represent 41% of the market in 2018, uh, which is pretty significant. Um, when you compare this, Look at this 2017 and 2018. Uh, we get pretty similar numbers, but I think the one thing that's kind of important to note on this is that those sales that occurred uh, price points of five million dollars and less accounted for 82 percent of the market, uh, roughly in 2017 and 2018. Which, uh, if you remember, uh, we're at 520 million dollars in total sales volume, so you know 82 percent is roughly 425 million dollars. Uh, it's a pretty significant share of our market. I know I'm going through this pretty quick, but kind of, I guess, time-wise. But uh, so this next graph deals with dollar, dollars per acre, average dollar per acre selling price, and I like it a little different than most people. Uh, we could put bar graphs up here, but 
So a value increase in this particular set is just a distribution graph. Uh, it's represented by moving right, you know, on the horizontal axis. And the frequency of the number of times you'll see an occurrence is measured going on the um, vertical axis. So, you know, your average values, obviously, you're going to see a higher frequency of that occurrence. And you'll see that we did have that 26% increase uh, in average dollar per acre selling price in 2018. Um, and <clears throat> median values also increased. Uh, 2018, we're 1,000. It's up from 850, roughly 18.5%. Uh, I like to look at these, I guess, mainly because you can see a little more, uh, like in the market, you can see variation. As the curve gets a little flatter or length widens out, there's more variation in the market, which, you know, when you're looking at a market as broad as the whole state of Montana, like, you'll anticipate that. Uh, if we look at a time period where we really didn't see much variation in 2009, you know, our market really contracted. Uh, properties were selling at a lower, much lower price point. Uh, you know, not, now we're out here like at 14,000 is our extreme value on this particular data set. And in 2009, we're you know, right here about just about 7,500. And then the average value obviously was, was fairly depressed. Um, so I don't know, hopefully you guys find that useful. Usually after I get down with this, people wonder how I can still be single. So, <laughs> so, <clears throat> Now we'll move into the Western Land Study, which uh, is, you know, it, the line keeps moving further east. So all our observations on the Western, in this particular data set, are coming from that red line uh, going west. Um, so it, it does, it has changed over the years. Um, from <clears throat> so in, the, in our Western Montana market area, we had 82 transactions in 2018 which is comparable to what we saw in 2005, which is what we, and our data shows was a peak uh, in this particular market. Uh, and then we'll, get, we'll compare uh, the time periods here in the next slide. But, uh, so in 2005, we had 323,000 deeded acres sell. Uh, in 2018, we're at 193,000. So average size has fallen some. Uh, when you look at 2005, 3,900 acres uh, versus the 2,340 acres in 2018. Uh, but we, <clears throat> Compared uh, these two time periods, 2001 to 2005, we're experiencing that run up to 2014 to 2018. You know, uh, as I said, we peaked in 2005, about met it in 2018. So, but the thing I find interesting here is that there's some similar trends in market activity uh, 2014 to 2018, as we saw, you know, prior to the run up in 2006 and 7. Uh, subsequent to 2005, sales activity fall, fell off. Um, Average dollar per acre price didn't fall off, um, just the number of transactions selling the larger properties. But you know, 2005, people were buying these larger properties and spinning them off in the smaller ones. Uh, we don't really have that occurring now. Uh, as Clark said, a lot of times people are buying smaller ones and putting them together and making a larger property. So I mean, it's, it is a different market, but I thought it was kind of interesting to compare that uh, particular measure. So here's total sales volume in Western Montana was 422 million. It's up roughly 95 percent from 2017, at least the way we measure it. Um, and again, as you might expect, where we have this similar number of transactions, we have this pretty similar number as far as total dollar sale volume, where it's 459 million in 2005. Um, again, we're at 422 million uh, in 2018. So there are some similarities um, to these two time periods. This again is comparing those two time periods, 2001 to 2005, and contrasting it to 2014 to 2018. Again, I guess as you imagine, similar similar run up in dollar sales volume, uh, which fell off significantly from 2005. Again, the dollar per acre price didn't fall off uh, until about 2007 or 2008. So it's not like the market tank. It's just I think we just had the there's so much turnover; these properties weren't coming back. <clears throat> So this graph deals with average dollar per acre. As Clark mentioned, we did uh, surpass that $2,000 an acre uh, sales price, uh, which did go above the, two, the peak that we show in 2007 of $1,900 an acre. Uh, it increased uh, 14, almost 15%, which is a little slower rate than we had in uh, 2017. So we're still increasing, but at a decreasing rate. Um, if we do the similar, uh, comparison with the dollar per acre purchase prices, you'll see 
2007 was what we show as the peak value. Uh, we have similar trends. The slopes of those lines are pretty similar to what we saw in the run-up uh, in, I uh, guess, what Clark calls the go-go days. And then, uh, obviously, we fell off <coughs> subsequent to 2007, uh, the economic contraction. And, uh, we finally recovered here in 2014. So this slide puts all that data together. Um, the blue line represents the number of sales occurring. Uh, and that orange background is the average dollar per acre selling price or unimproved land value. Um, and if, as I mentioned, you know, 2005, we peaked in the number of transactions, uh, but our values continued to grow into 2007, fell off slightly in 2008, and then uh, everything kind of went to heck in 2008. Uh, but one thing I think is important to notice, you know, we, it's not like a, just appreciation across the board on all these properties. You know, uh, it's like ag driven from 2010. 13 and then the recreational buyers kind of reemerge. So the property types are selling are you know different higher value properties. So it's not if you any of the resales that we analyze are much lower than that 15 or 16 percent growth that we've seen in unimproved dollar per acre. But if a guy was gonna predict what could happen, I guess here, I mean, you know, based on everything, I mean, you should see some you know value growth still next year if inventory is limited. There's just things have turned over at such a rate, I don't know how much uh, is available. But that's uh, pretty much what I got on this, and we'll hand it off to Andy. Okay, now I'm going to talk about um, actual 2018 sales data from the Montana Land Source data set. Shared this before. Um, actually, I'll walk over here. 194 total sales in 2018. Um, percent of those sales that experienced price changes, 40, uh, uh, a price change, 41 percent. 41 percent of properties that sold in 2018 experienced a price reduction from their original ask price. The average percent change of that was 34 percent. So of all this, of, of the 41 percent that experienced a price reduction, the average was 34%. Um, average land value per acre is $1,500 an acre, which we have down 17% from 2017. Average days on the market, shared this earlier, 528 days, up 21%. I always like to share the USDA data. Um, this is this is survey data, so they, they survey landowners, really producers and managers as much as anybody. And I like going back to all the way to 2003. It just you know shows the run up, of course, very well, and shows the drop off. But it was interesting if you remember. Uh, so the green is cropland, uh, all cropland, and if you remember uh, during the crash, ag ground and cropland actually was kind of the only thing going on. Uh, commodity prices actually weren't too bad at that time. So we did see some ag transactions, but blue is overall and the um, dark green is native rangeland. See, they obviously dived and then everything's, you know, recovered pretty well for a while, but we've kind of seen a leveling since about 2014 um, through 2018. Uh, here's my line. We all have a different line for eastern Montana to western Montana. Um, I just follow counties uh, basically that uh, have mountain foothill, I guess you could say, as western Montana versus eastern Montana. So I'm going to share some data east to west, and that's the line where I, that I draw. So number of sales by year. So these graphs, um, eastern Montana is reflected as yellow, western Montana is reflected as green, and then blue is total, so cumulative. So again, number of sales, and like Mike said, we started to see a drop in 2005, um, you know, before the actual crash, but obviously uh, really crashed volume-wise in 2019 and have been growing ever since. Um, one thing I'll say about 2018, uh, it's too early in the year for us to truly have all the 2018 data. So I think 2018 tends to be a little lower than it actually will be because there's going to be sales rolling in for the next couple months. So, you know. This shows a slight drop, uh, at least from the total state and for Western Montana, but that may not be the actual case. Interesting, nonetheless, Eastern Montana a little bit up. Um, throwing on 
so again, you know, to the total of 200 sales, um, and with 600 almost on the market, that shows that generally we run at a three-year inventory in terms of what's on the market and what sells historically year to year. Median uh, dollars per acre land value. Um, Western Montana shows a lot of erratic uh, over the past couple of years, but uh, Montana overall up a little bit going into 2018. Um, Eastern Montana down a little. Average days on the market. Um, again, yellow being Eastern Montana, green being Western Montana, blue being all. Uh, Western Montana up pretty substantially. Um, with the stays on market. Actually, everything kind of creeping up. Eastern Montana over the past couple of years, you can see the trend is longer times on the market. I guess Mon Western Montana's been a little volatile, but overall up and same thing with Montana overall. And again, on the market today, the listings on the market, the average has been, they've been on the market 571 days, so a year and a half-ish. Uh, sale price as a percent of list price. Um, I should have mentioned in that first graph, let me go back, oops, maybe. We're, we've gotten more, this number here, 34%, we've gotten more aggressive on, it's a, it's a difficult pri uh, data point, original list price. Property switch brokers, they go off the market for a little while, back on the market, you know, how far do you go back, what do you call original, I would actually say this is some, somewhat conservative. If the, if the property's been on the market, I'm sorry, if the property's been off the market for a substantial mar uh, period of time, if the property's um, switch brokerages, uh, we usually reset that. So in some ways that's not reflective. We all know, you know there's some properties you know, that have had huge price reductions. So in some ways that's a little bit uh, conservative. So moving forward. Uh, and this is not original ask price. This is um, the last active list price. We don't have original price going back this far in time. We hope to backfill that data maybe in the future. And of course, moving forward, we'll have it. So this isn't as informative as that, that other statistic, but um, it's pretty steady, I guess you would say in general, you know, kind of around the 85, 90% um, of, of last stated list price. Sale price versus list price. And that's all I have. Thanks for your support. And like I always like to say, the more data you guys share with us, the more we can do with it. So we appreciate your guys' help in sharing data. Next up, rolled. Thanks, Andy. Uh, I'm Rolled Augustin. I'm an appraiser at Northwest Farm Credit here in Bozeman. And uh, I'll start off with a, a quote that might uh, illuminate a little bit of what uh, kind of process an appraiser goes through. Uh, for any, any of you who read appraisals, this might uh, shed some light on the, the thinking. Um, it's kind of like, uh, like eating an oil and gas mixture, right? An old temperamental chainsaw. Sometimes it's a little hard to, to get uh, those two things in the right order. So I'm going to talk uh, a little bit about a couple different regions, three different regions in Montana. I'm going to start with North Central Montana, uh, primarily our uh, more ag driven market, um, dry crop predominant in that area, the Golden Triangle. Uh, I'm going to transition to South Central Montana, and then I'll talk a little bit about Eastern Montana. <laughs> kind of interesting. Uh, North Central Montana has 11, 11 counties. Uh, South Central, we'll talk about seven counties. Eastern Montana, uh, 30, well, excuse me, 18 counties that make up about 34% of the state. So we're off North Central Montana. Give you a look at 2017 uh, values to kind of see where we were at in 2017. Uh, everything mostly stable, stable to increasing. Uh, we did see some kind of wait and see or, or some uh, skepticism in uh, dry crop rental rates with uh, weak commodity prices. But in 2018, uh, that has stabilized and we've seen some expansion. Uh, probably important to note that uh, we've seen some expansion in the top end of all of, most of these ranges here. 
Uh, the bottom has kind of stayed about the same, but uh, we have seen some expansion in uh, the top ends of, of some of these markets. Uh, we'll start with a look at irrigated crop in north central Montana. Uh, this is a look at the last 10 years. Uh, the gray bars are median, blue, and mean. And the number of sales. And Andy kind of alluded to the fact that if you look off here on the far right side, the number of sales for 2018, it's what we kind of call a verification lag. We don't always get sales in uh, right when they happen. So uh, 2018 sales, and even uh, back to 2017, we'll see some sales trickling in. Um, you know, over the course of a couple of years. So that's a, that's not exactly representative maybe of uh, what happened in 2018, but uh, you can see overall the trend over the last 10 years is uh, you know, a positive trend. Uh, we did see a little bit of, I guess, uh, softening, if you will, in 2018. However, as I just noted, uh, we saw some expansion at the top end of those markets. So. I think what's going on there is that we've got a higher proportion of lower valued uh, properties selling that are pulling that down because uh, you know the sales that we've been seeing have, have been uh, fairly high in a lot, of, a lot of markets. Dry crop, kind of the same story. Uh, you can definitely you can notice a significant difference of the divergence between the median and the mean here. Um, got some, some higher value, higher dollar sales that are skewing that, those values up. Um, but a, a positive trend, a little more erratic, but a positive trend overall. Uh, this, uh, this is something I put together last year because uh, over the last several years, we've seen a negative trend in wheat prices. Um, for th this is uh, USDA data taken from National Ag Statistics. Uh, we've seen a major divergence between the wheat markets and dry crop markets in North Central Montana and, and across the state for that matter. But uh, take a look at wheat price. This is uh, average wheat price received by month for the last 10 years. You see that trend is pretty undeniable. Dry crop, median dry crop values. A uh, negative correlation for sure that's hard to explain. So uh, I think what's what's happening there is uh, people are, we've got a number of producers that are, uh, that have a, a pretty significant land base that are, that are buying ground at higher than average values and uh, soaking that up with, with equity uh, in their land base. So it doesn't really make sense. Um, we did see, like I mentioned, uh, I think we've got some uh, higher proportion of, of lower value sales kind of pulling that median down in 2018. But um, the, the high end, the top end of the market has definitely uh, increased. So I think that trend will, will continue going forward. We'll take a quick look at South Central Montana, primarily the counties around Billings. This is what kind of what we saw in 2017. Here's where we were, where we were at in 2018. Uh, everything, you know, pretty stable, stable to increasing. We got a pretty significant uh, expansion in the top end of the range for irrigated crop. Uh, slight expansion in the market for dry crop. Uh, rents pretty stable, but kind of the same thing. So we see. A little bit of softening there in spite of the, the expansion in the top end of those markets. So, one thing that's going to stand out that kind of jumps off uh, these graphs in South Central Montana, you'll see the number of sales, uh, the high, <laughs> the high <coughs> premiums in, in 2014, and the, the low number of sales. Uh, we had some, uh, I guess, a staff member in Billings that was out for a good part of the year in 2014. Uh, so, our Sales verification was a little lower in 2014, so you're going to see that in all three of these, these charts. Look at the pasture, uh, and you know, I, I think these, these means being skewed by uh, values, uh, upper end values for uh, probably more recreationally oriented properties. 
Now for Eastern Montana. Kind of the same story, everything is stable or stable to increasing. Um, not a whole lot of change in the markets um, in Eastern Montana. And you know, a trend across across these uh, land types, uh, across these three regions, you know, pretty consistent, a pretty steady upward trend. And you see the high needs for for uh, pasture and range. Probably you can see me by. You got the the lower end uh, egg production ground and uh, the high end recreation. I'll leave you guys with uh, one thought for you. Uh, lenders, brokers, agents uh, in the room, my wife, uh, you will well be able to relate to this next slide. Thank you. Thanks, Roll. Um, we're going to move the discussion a little closer to home. Um, take a look at some things going on around the greater Bozeman area and the Big Sky area, which, you know, as we'll see, has a tremendous influence on us around here, and also um, some of the different surrounding areas in Bozeman, or, I'm sorry, in uh, Belgrade and Livingston, which are starting to pick up quite a bit of spillover from, from us at this point. So I call this the tipping point. Because I think if any of us have looked around here for a while, see what's going on as you walk out the door every day, um, things are starting to feel a little different around here. And you know, this slide is actually from the Downtown Bozeman Improvement Plan. They did a real nice job of showing the population growth of uh, Bozeman over time. And there was actually a real nice little trend line building from about World War II to about 2000. Um, and if it continued, would look like that, but that's not what happened. And down here at the bottom, they also did a real nice job of showing how the footprint of the town has changed over those periods of time. So obviously, everyone's gotten a memo about Bozeman, and just about every publication that likes to talk about this stuff has mentioned that. <coughs> and as far as a boom, you know, we feel like we've been here before, right? Um, in the go-go days, as Clark likes to call them. We had a lot of speculative subdivision, Mostly, a lot of it due to easy credit conditions, too easy, as it turned out to be. Uh, but Bozeman had somewhat of a narrow economic base at that point in time. Uh, it was more of a traditional construction, tourism, that type of thing. A lot of new developers jumped into the game, as you may recall from those days. Um, at least when I was doing things in those days, I was working with a planner in Billings, and we got constant calls for due diligence on new developers who were looking to see if what they bought could be something subdivided to come up with what they were looking for. Um, baby boomers were driving the market, 40s and 40 year olds and 50 year olds whose buyer motivation was probably misplaced. Uh, it was very short term, it was very investment driven. Uh, return in those days meant you know, borrow money easily and flip it. Whereas in the current cycle, we've got more of a building boom than a speculative subdivision boom. Uh, we've got redevelopment, infill, and new subdivision tighter credit conditions, a diversifying economy, with a lot more sectors active, more experienced developers in the game, and the boomers are kind of fading out, and the millennials are stepping up, and so the market's definitely changing in that regard. There's a significant transformation going on downtown, as everybody knows, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. But the buyer motivation now tends to be lifestyle. It tends to be buy and hold for appreciation. It's more enabled by the Occupy and Airbnb it strategy, to borrow and flip a strategy. Airbnb has, has changed a lot of things um, about motivation, about the rental property markets. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that when we get to the big sky information. But in Bozeman now, I'm going to look at these slides over here. Sorry about that. 
And Bozeman is now no longer just downtown. It's a city of nodes. Northeast, Cannery, Fairgrounds, Midtown, the 19th Corridor, University, what's going on on West Huffine, on Marketplace. In November, there were four trains on the Bozeman skyline. Long time since we even saw one. Uh, MSU enrollment from fall 2010 to fall 2018, up 24%. <coughs> Airport and planes from 2012 to 2017, up 32%. Healthcare facilities, you know, big expansion of Bozeman Health, and now Billings Clinic coming to town with a 54 acre project, 97,000 square foot structure, and $40 million worth of investment. And just a, a quite diversifying economy, just a lot more sectors active than there were back in the COVID days. So Bozeman's growth seems to be like it's reaching critical mass. Um, there was a report out last year that most people saw in the paper, Bozeman's now the fastest growing U.S. micropolitan statistical area, which is out of 551 areas that surround cities of 10 to 50,000 residents. The Bozeman Micropolitan Statistic Area is now about 107,000 in population, which includes all of Gallatin County. Growth rate of 3.6%, which if sustained, would double our population in 20 years. So in a year or two, we're gonna see a bump in economic classification, most likely to a metropolitan statistical area, which sounds like kind of a wonky difference, but it significantly changes the game as far as Bozeman's concerned. Uh, in terms of how the city's branded, how it's looked at, you know, by businesses and entities expanding here, in terms of its economic capacity and its potential in the market. It really accelerates the transition from our small town to more of a small urban city. And so what do the development patterns look like? Tom and I work together to pull this together. You know, there's a lot of different ways you can look at this. We're gonna look at kind of growth in subdivision lots. And the way we chose to look at it was to basically pull out whenever a parcel was assigned a new assessor's tax ID number, we call it a lot. And of course, from 29 to 2012, there wasn't much going on. We were pretty hungry now. That's my transition. Yeah. <laughs> His are better, but mine aren't bad. Um, you know, in 2013-14, you know, was it safe to come out? We started to see some of the first big projects out of the western part of town. Expansion out northeast, they woke up. Middle Creek Parklands came on the scene. The Woodland Park subdivision showed up. The South Bridge subdivision showed up. And about 211 new subdivision lots were created over the two years, 2013-2014. In 2015, it was kind of like riding a bike. It was just like the old days, 655 new lots. Uh, you started to see some of the Bigger subdivisions that we're aware of now, Ryan Glenn showed up for the first time, Galton Heights showed up for the first time, um, <clears throat> Northeast again expanded, Woodland Park again, Middle Creek again, basically sub subdivisions were growing in size. In 2016, another 632 lots. If you look at the side, the colors are a little different, it's a little easier to follow. <clears throat> another phase of Ryan Glen, another phase of Dallin Heights, another phase of Middle Creek, another phase of Falcon Hollow, Flanders Mill shows up for the first time, and Spring Hill Reserve and Bridger Lake Meadows show up up here northeast of town. In 2017, there was kind of a break in the action. I, I think it was mostly just a, a more of a backlog issue than anything else. And then we worked through that backlog this past year with 335 additional new lots. And again, you see another Ryan Glen, another Gallatin Heights, another Woodland Park, another Spring Hill, another Flanders expansion. So these subdivisions are getting larger. And if you look at the actual footprint of what's planned for the subdivision, you'll see they're gonna get even bigger. So that's 1,650 new lots over four years. So it's obviously more in pipe. Um, apparently there's been another one just announced outside of Belgrade, 595 lots. Um, just kind of occurring out here west of the Stanton area. So that's a, that's a lot of property coming up. If you look at the Bozeman City Planning Interactive map, you can see that all these little patched areas 
are all projects that either have preliminary plan approval or final plan approval. So those were not part of the previous maps. And then I tried to show it a little bit easier. That's kind of a hard slide to read, but basically the pink arrows are subdivisions, the blue arrows are kind of projects. And as we mentioned, downtown Bozeman is undergoing its own transformation. From 2009 to 2018, there were 97 new housing units added. There were 60,000 square foot of office space, two new hotels. What's under construction today? What you see over here on the right, right? Four gate housing units, 122 hotel rooms, and two mixed buildings. But on the immediate horizon, approved or proposed, there are 275 housing units, 127 hotel rooms, and two more mixed use buildings. And then the downtown improvement plan projected that going out to 2045, you're looking at 400 more housing units and 200,000 more square feet of downtown. If you're interested and you haven't looked at the downtown improvement plan online, it's really an interesting document. I would really encourage you to go. And then Big Sky, obviously stuff's rolling downhill. There's the Big Sky we all knew for those of us that moved here 25, 26 years ago. And this is Big Sky as we know it today. Big Sky is very definitely Bozeman's X Factor. I don't know how many of you walk around and you hear people say, you know, where's all this coming from? You know, what's all happening? Well, there's a big thing going on 45 minutes up the road. Um, the Big Sky 2025, initiative that the resort put in place in 2016 is now in full swing. Billion dollars in improvements in process. Depending on who you talk to, people estimate that 2,000 people drive up and down the highway each day between Bozeman and Big Sky. If that's true, you know, if there's 46,000 people in this town, that's probably about 10% of the adult population. Um, it's pretty significant. So Big, Big Sky is really an unseen force in this town that's generating hundreds of millions of dollars of spillover. Many people feel that last year was the breakout year for Bozeman. We had an epic snow year when most of the rest of the West did not. That word got out. Skier visits were way up. Uh, three new hotels are on the horizon. One of them is about to open. And the club effect is something very unique to Bozeman, or I'm sorry, to Big Sky relative to the other uh, big ski resort towns like Park City and such. You know, a lot of times the knock on Big Sky was there was no there there. You know, there was no place to generate body heat other than the slopes. And the clubs took, took that on. Um, after the crash, when they reconstituted coming out, they've really become the marketing and investment engine of that town now. And they're filling the void associated with a lack of proximity to a major metro feeder like a Denver or Salt Lake. Uh, they're really defining the area. As far as the markets are concerned up there, you know, retail buyers generally tend to prefer built product over lot product. People want to step in and enjoy the real estate today. They don't necessarily want to undertake a big construction project like maybe was the case back in the go-go days. It's very much a lifestyle commitment versus an investment commitment now. If you talk to brokers up there, they'll tell you it's not a very attractive investment market. The, the cash flows, you know, the rents can't keep pace with the price increases. So the properties don't cash flow. Again, you've got an Airbnb effect going on up there. You know, who would want to buy a rental property and lease it out, you know, on an exclusive basis when they can lease it, you know, occupy it for six or eight weeks themselves and Airbnb it? So investment return up there is very much generated by sales price appreciation. But a flexible horizon is required. I mean, if you buy with a specific time period that you have to sell and you caught the wrong time, you're definitely going to fit. And it's, you know, as a resort market, it generally lags national trends by one to two years. So if we see a slowdown in the national economy, you'll probably start to see some of them slow down in the big sky. But it's probably a better position for it than it was uh, 10, 12 years ago. The clubs are now very well capitalized. They're expanding. Only about 10 to 15 percent of the real estate up in Big Sky is financed. Um, probably the commercial markets are the most vulnerable because the rents are high and the shoulder seats are small. It's going to be hard for them to keep their cash flowing. 
and the recognized challenges up there, I don't think any of these are a big mystery, but there's typically a shortage to build product up there. Um, it's a short season to build. It's a long transit time to get stuff from here to there. Uh, that generally means that there's going to be extended lead times for new product, and there's often going to be shortages when the market's hot. Um, depending on who you talk to up there, you know, some people say perilously too close to too much too fast. Um, the infrastructure is struggling to keep up. The workforce housing issue is always there, uh, but they're, they're holding their own for now. And they're, they are encumbered by the struggle <coughs> with their location, the fact that they travel to counties, they've got multiple regulatory environments they have to deal with, and they're a long way from their planning departments. If you want to submit a project at Big Sky, you're going to come down here and get in line behind everything that's happening in Bozeman. And lastly, in Livingston, Katie's going to talk quite a bit about this. Um, we were riding through it, through the bust. Not much happened from 2015 to 2018. There was some trickle down coming over from Bozeman. Uh, one good sized project took place. But then this past year, boom, North Town. 400 plus lots, 8,900 square foot, priced at 49,000, about 40 to 50% of Bozeman's price point, supporting the price point of homes that everybody's looking for around here. You know, this is really kind of the first time that Livingston has taken that big of a spillover effect from Bozeman, so that may be a game changer. And so I'm gonna let Katie take over and she's gonna to talk to you about the numbers. Hello, my name is Katie Tamil. I'm an appraiser here in Bozeman. Can you hear me? Yeah, okay. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and pick up where Bruce left off and talk about residential trends in the greater Bozeman area, including Four Corners, Belgrade, Livingston, and Big Sky. And I've got too many things in my hand, so I'm sorry. Bozeman and the surrounding areas, as Bruce said, are one of the fastest growing non-metropolitan areas in the country. Part of the influx is due to the outdoor amenities. We have seen a rise in tech and outdoor industries relocating to Bozeman. Enrollment at MSU continues to increase. Tourism continues to be popular and more and more people are moving here for the high quality <coughs> life. Bozeman has become two distinct markets that are east of 19th and west of 19th. We'll start with East Bozeman. Although we have a number of sales that remain generally consistent, the median price has increased 27% from 2015 to 2018, to the point we now have a median sales price of half a million dollars. This price shows high demand for properties within walking distance of downtown. As you can see, half a million dollars. Um, sales price has been increasing linearly over the past four years, with typical marketing time being under a month. Sales price per square foot has seen a $20 increase year after year. However, price per square foot is not always a reliable indicator of value for East Bozeman. A 700 square foot home recently sold in the Northeast neighborhood. It was virtually uninhabitable. Um, this sales price was a reflection of the land value only. Buying a house just to tear it down is a common occurrence in East Bozeman. On the other half of Bozeman, there's a new high school, new commercial and residential development, a 100-acre park, and the city's largest sports complex. The number of sales have increased 24% in four years, along with a 32% increase in median sales price. As you can see in the chart, my median sales price has increased $100,000 in four years. Sales price per square foot is below East Bozeman, and days on the market are only a couple days longer than homes on East Bozeman. The, at this rate of increase, home sales in 2021 would be half a million dollars also. And is this sustainable in this market? OK, 
And comparing East to West Bozeman shows you that homes in East Bozeman generally are about $100,000 more than homes in West Bozeman. Both East and West show a similar rate of price increase. Moving further west to Four Corners, home sales have not increased as much as they have inside the city limits. People are moving to Four Corners for close proximity to Big Sky and employment. And because you can find larger homes, that are more affordable for larger families. There is an increase in both residential and commercial development in Four Corners. However, Four Corners still holds the lowest price per square foot in the Bozeman area. Other Four Corners sales data is generally aligned with East Bozeman and West Bozeman. Number of sales in downtown Belgrade has seen no change, whereas the sprawl has seen an increase of 129%. This is due to the rise in subdivision development, as Bruce reported. Found also in Belgrade is the opposite situation, as Bozeman, where outside of downtown is more expensive and downtown is less expensive. Don't believe me, look at my charts. Them, that's great. Um, you can see in 2018, a house outside of downtown is north of 300,000, and a home downtown is just shy of 300,000. It is also interesting that downtown Belgrade has had the lowest days on market in the valley. The expanding Belgrade area is not expected to slow down anytime soon with a 595 lot subdivision currently in planning. Prescott subdivision will sit on the northwest corner of the Belgrade city limits. This combined with the development of the Yellowstone Plaza growth at the airport means that there's no slowdown in Belgrade with construction. This map is made by Tom and it takes everything I just said and puts it on one map so I could have skipped all of that, I'm sorry. But here you go. Okay, so you can see downtown Bozeman is on fire, and then it kind of dominoes out to Four Corners and Belgrade. As I stated earlier, Bozeman has the highest density of high volume sales. This is the same idea, both price per square foot, and it really highlights the effect of Belgrade with the downtown properties going for less than the properties in the expanding Belgrade area, which is totally opposite from Bozeman. <coughs> Livingston. The number of sales have remained consistent in recent history. However, the last two years have seen a significant increase in median sales price. Values between 2015 and 2016 only saw a $10,000 increase then in 2017, there was a $30,000 increase followed by a $40,000 increase. With the new demand for housing in Livingston, a 400 home subdivision is in the planning phases. In addition to that, there will be a new entry to the north side of town to improve traffic. So why Livingston? You get that downtown property with the price that you can afford, unlike both of them. Big Sky. Big Sky single family home sales have increased by half a million in the last four years. It is the most expensive market in our area. And it is driven by tourism and the three clubs, the Yellowstone Club, Spanish Peaks Club, and Clearline Basin. The number of condo sales are triple single family sales and one third of the price for 2018. Land costs and high build costs keep single family homes more expensive. This graph illustrates the volatility in the single family market and the consistency in the condominium market in Big Sky. Not unex unexpected for a secondary home resort area. Okay, life after the recession has been good for construction in Big Sky. Currently, there are two luxury lodges under construction and a new hotel in the meadow. 
The first luxury lodge is the montage of Big Sky, as you see in the illustration. The montage will have 150 guest rooms, 39 residential condos, three restaurants, one lobby bar, a pub, event center, flat pool, family pool, fitness center, spa, and a bowling alley. And a I know, I tried, I tried to add that in, but it just it didn't rhyme. <laughs> this is going to cost just around 400 million. This is being built by Montage International, a cross Harbor Capital Partners, set to open in 2021. It is described as the first ultra luxury resort in Big Sky and will be the largest building in Montana. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> the Yellowstone Club Village is our second luxury lodge being built in Big Sky. This is a bird's eye view of it. The video can get a little confusing because it bobs and weaves. So just kind of get your footing. The old Warren Miller Lodge is there, and this is all the new stuff. Okay. I will get there, don't you worry. The Yellowstone Club Village, 508,000 square feet, 375 parking spots, 48 condos, six pools, three markets, three restaurants. This will cost just north of 300 million, and it does not include the finishing of the condos. Two to 3,000 contractors <coughs> commute daily to work in the club. These two projects, the Montage and the Village, are two of the largest construction projects in Montana to date. Um, and that is it for me. I guess my question is, is this sustainable? Can we continue at this pace? I, I, I don't know. <laughs> Thanks. Last stop is going to be Tom, so I can't express the appreciation for uh, staying and watching all these people through the patients. And we all appreciate that. Thank you. You almost made it. I'm last. Here we go. So I'm Tom Kingsbury. I'm with Part and Parcel, Montana. I do fair majority of the GIS work for these fine folks and if you guys are looking for some GIS work feel free to contact me you can chat that's what my website looks like you can find it so we saw a lot of those heat maps today and I just wanted to give since we started very wide I wanted to kind of drill all the way down to just a single subdivision and maybe it'll help wrap your head around how these interpolation heat maps kind of work so um, I took 64 exposed sales in the subdivision in 2018 and then you can see there's all the sale prices and the range on the right there and these interpolations basically allow you to find the values in between these known points so you go from there to to this view and you can see kind of where the anomalous or the higher price points will stand out in a set and then this would be the dollar per square foot view and then coming back to the sales and their respective dollar per square foot of each of the, the sales there so that's just kind of a ultra small example of kind of what we've been doing on a wider scale to maybe give a better view or a, a secondary example <coughs> but on the lighter side of things i thought it'd be fun to take a look at the larger landowners in montana um, and you pull the whole cadastral layer for the entire state there's nearly a million parcels 930 some odd thousand um, so if you start trying to group those by owner or by tax address you kind of come up with some interesting things so for the, the tenth largest landowner is clearwater blackfoot i included industrial properties or larger you know what wouldn't be considered ranch property but i mean they own what they own so i just kind of went with what the information had so this is a, a timber company outside of missoula um, for number nine is the Great Northern Properties, which is a coal investment that came from a Burlington 
Northern or like the railroad properties kind of as they split out their interests. And then number eight is uh, Turner Enterprises, as we know, his influence around the area here. Uh, the seventh largest landowner in the state is Sunlight Ranch Company, which is uh, Sinclair Oil, oil um, or Robert Earl Holdings at the time. Um, he also owned the Sun Valley Ski Resort, which I thought was kind of an interesting extra factoid. Um, after that, the sixth largest is Farmland Reserve Incorporated, which is uh, the Mormon Church. They got a fair spread of, of ranches throughout eastern and central Montana. Uh, the fifth largest is the 71 Ranch, which would be uh, the Galt Rankin uh, family, historically. Uh, for four would be the Coffee Nepsey family, as well as Stock and Bank fame, mostly centered around Miles City there. And then we have uh, Stan Kroenke for number three of LA Rams fame. And number two, we have Wilkes Ranch, which is a Texas oil. And the number one would be Warehouser, which is a large timber company that recently merged with uh, Plum Creek with over with 688,000 acres. I mean, that's quite a bit. And as I was going through all these different entities, uh, the Hooterite colonies kept coming up again and again. I thought, why don't I just see how much land they have all? Again, not really one entity, but you put them all together, they nearly have as much land as Weyerhaeuser, 671,000 acres. So I thought that was kind of an interesting thought. So if you add up all of those acres, it still only accounts for less than 6% of the public, or excuse me, private land available in Montana. So there's still a lot of room to make a play, guys. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so roughly, uh, Two thirds of the state is public and one third, or excuse me, two thirds is private and one third is public and exempt. So if you took all of that ground and kind of shoved it all together, kind of think of mostly almost Billings East or a little bit further over there, just as a visual for the heck of it. And that kind of brings me to the end. Oh, actually, I got a little more, I forgot. So another few statistics is out of that huge 930. Uh, excuse me, 930,000 parcels. You start looking at the entities, there's 415,000 folks with 1,000 acres or less, 10,000 vestings of 1,000 acres or more, around 2,000 with 5,000 acres or more, about 670 with 10,000 acres or more, about 180 with 20,000 acres or more. It starts to drop off pretty significantly. Around 40,000 acres, there's about 50 folks for vestings. And if you get to 80,000 acres, there's only 15 entities in the state with that acreage or more. And as I'm a dad now, the dad jokes kind of come, so I figured I'd leave you with this. <laughs> so thank you.